Good afternoon, and thank you for joining today's webinar from Spec Innovations, Program Management, and MBSE. My name is Taylor Duffy, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. First, I'd like to go over some housekeeping. During the presentation, feel free to send us questions, and we will get them answered in the Q&A part of the webinar. You can also interact with us on LinkedIn through the Innoslate Users Group or through Twitter using the handle at Spec Innovations. The webinar is being recorded and will be made available to you after the live presentation, so keep an eye out for it in your inbox. Now I'd like to introduce to you our presenter, Spec Innovations President and Founder, Dr. Stephen Dan. Dr. Dan has been involved with research, experiments, operations analysis, software development, systems engineering, and training for more than 40 years. He has also received an expert systems engineering professional, ESEP certification from ICOSI. He is currently applying systems engineering techniques to various DOD, DOE, and commercial projects. Feel free to send him any questions through the LinkedIn users group or send him an email to stephen.dan.speckinnovations.com. And now I'll hand over the controls to Dr. Dan and we'll get started. Thanks, Taylor. Appreciate it. And I see people are still joining us, so that's good. Um, anyway, so I'll just go over the agenda here quickly. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about why programs fail. Um, I think that's always a good place to start when you're talking about program management. We're going to try to particularly figure out how we're going to do it better. Uh, and then what's the difference between program management and systems engineering? There's a lot of overlap between the two disciplines, and so we're going to talk about that and what those differences are. And then how can systems engineering better support programs? program management. That should be a goal of all systems engineers. Is to, they, 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 they work hand in glove with the program management to make sure the program succeeds. Uh, and how can program management and systems engineering become more agile? That's a, that's a topic that always is popping up. How can we do this faster, better, cheaper? And then last but not least, I want to talk a little about how InnoSlate supports this integration between systems engineering and program management. So let's start with why programs fail. A lot of reasons, of course, you know that they fail, including uh, not well defined at the executive level. Oftentimes you need a top down kind of view of the project to make sure that it's really going to meet the, the end goals and it has the support it needs by the management of the organization. Um, you know, if, if it's coming bottom up, that tends to be less likely that, that they'll have the resources provided that are necessary to make the program or project successful. Uh, also, implementation plans are not developed within team environment. In other words, they're often, someone goes off in a corner, develops the implementation plan, uh, and in fact, I saw this a lot when I was doing uh, proposals. Uh, the group doing the proposal was not the group executing the program. And when you got handed this uh, this program, it was unexecutable often. <laughs> so, so you spent your first few months uh, getting the customer reoriented to a new project plan that was going to be successful. <laughs> Um, and insufficient amount of time for planning and systems engineering. So a lot of times people don't want to take the time it takes to do this right. Uh, I worked on one project where um, we got the award late and um, they said, okay, uh, we want you to do the system requirements review in two weeks and then the SDR after that, uh, a month after that. We did it, went through it all, Gave them a lot of good stuff, actually. And then said, well, thanks. We're done with the systems engineering. We can go off write code. And uh, six months later, they were in trouble and were uh, calling in the, the, the cavalry. <laughs> um, lack of well-defined processes. I, that's another big one. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've gone in, in even just into a proposal process and asked, well, what are your processes you're going to use for this project? And they go, I don't know, I don't know. So I'll give mine, uh, <laughs> which are a well-defined set of processes. They're in my book, uh, Real MBSC, if you want to read them in detail. Um, we'll talk about the actual procedures we use. Uh, that includes both program management and systems engineering processes, by the way. Um, so, so what's the result of a program failure? Well, 
you can certainly have huge cost overruns. We see that all the time. Uh, most government projects overrun significantly, uh, as much as a factor two. Uh, some of that's the unrealistic bidding. Uh, somebody will bid half of what it really costs to do the job, and they'll get the award. And then next thing that you know, they're constantly saying, well, wait a minute, we didn't know you wanted that. We're gonna add this amount of money in. So all of a sudden, next thing they know, that's ballooned back up to what was maybe a, a more reasonable bid, and would have happened at a much more reasonable pace had it been dealt with correctly in the beginning. Long scheduled delays, that's another one. And of course, you see almost any highway construction project seems to take forever, <laughs> right? <laughs> so that's part of that same problem. You know, A lot of times it's just people didn't do good planning. Um, upfront planning things that they need to do uh, that later on in the life cycle and uh, particularly develop capturing long lead items. Program cancellations occur all the time. Uh, big programs you see go on for you know five, ten years, and then next thing you know they're canceled because well they didn't do what somebody thought they should have done in the time they had. So move on. And usually what happens with that is they break it up into pieces. And then a lot of those failure modes uh, proliferate, actually, and get worse <laughs> over time. And then last but not least, it's really important is the loss of life and reputation. That can happen in, in any kind of project where um, you were basically the stucky on it. You were the one that, that they, they pointed the fingers to. That's why it failed. Uh, how many things like the BP oil spill have been you know, pointed back to poor program management or poor systems engineering. Uh, so these are these are things that are that are have significant impacts. So what's the difference between program management and systems engineering? Okay, again, there's like I said, there's a lot of overlap. Uh, PMI and Encosi recognized that years ago and and wrote a very nice book about integrating systems engineering and project management. Uh, so if you look at it, uh, systems engineers do requirements definition. That's certainly a major part of it. The program manager is looking at the project goal definitions. Very similar, actually, in nature a lot of times. Uh, there's some overlap between the, the two. Uh, but, you know, it, this is the system requirements on the system side as opposed to the project itself. What's the project trying to accomplish? That, that might be somewhat different. Uh, than the, what the system goals are. Accountability is important to both groups. Um, it's you know tracking things, understanding who's responsible for what, uh, making sure that, that 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 things get done when they're supposed to. You have to do that tracking. It takes it takes quite a bit of work. Um, so in in systems engineering, we do something called iterative decomposition, right? So we break down the problem to, to a level that, you know, we start with a fairly high level abstract problem of the system, view the system until we can break it down into components we can buy or build. Well, the work breakdown structure does the same thing for on the program side. You're breaking down the, the work packages, the tasks that are being performed uh, through that process. So again, very similar kind of thing, but a little different in how it's applied. Measurements on the SE side, of course, are important, and metrics on the program management side. Again, very similar, very, in fact, people will use the terms interchangeably uh, between the two groups. And some of the metrics, again, will overlap. There will be certain metrics that are appropriate for the project that do, are, are, do have an impact on the system as well. Standard-based control on the system side, project control on the, on the program management side. Optimization and corrective action. Again, you can see how these line up with each other. And of course, relationships on both sides are very important. The program managers orchestrating particularly the outer relationships with the outside stakeholders. The systems engineers working on the relationships between the design engineering in, in, in particular. And so that's a lot of their part of it. So they tend to look downward. And, and of course, systems engineers have to look upward too. But and again, the PM similarly. But overall, that's that's the kind of oftentimes the breakout of it. 
Uh, traceability and responsibility, that's, those kind of go with accountability, uh, if you think about it. They're very similar kinds of ideas uh, in, terms of, in terms of how that's looked at. So again, you can see there's just a lot of this connection between the two. And that's because they're both optimizing cost, schedule, and performance. The program manager does it for the program, the systems engineer does it for the system. And so those are all factors. And of that, we're also mitigating risk in each of those areas. So risk has another factor that comes into play here that's important, again, for both groups. So you can see that overlap. It's just, it's just a huge percentage. Okay. So we have that now. How can systems engineers better support program management? Well, first of all, we have to recognize who, what the roles are and in, in making the, the program a success. So that's, a, that's an important thing about it. Recognize and respect each other's roles, work together as a team. Um, uh, you know, if you get a small enough project, you may be both. You may be the program manager and the chief systems engineer running it. And I've ha had that situation more than once. Uh, so, so that's an interesting position to be put in. But, but very often on bigger programs, you'll, those will be two separate disciplines, two separate groups of people. One may not be an engineer at all, by the way. Uh, and I won't tell you which one. <laughs> I've seen it both ways. So, so chief systems engineer wasn't an, didn't have an engineering background but the PM did <laughs> oh, it's interesting so you know the first job if you want to think about it is to develop the requirements needed for design engineering that's the systems engineer's job that's our primary job we need to be doing that and we need to be thinking about that job through the whole process life cycle right we also want to make sure that we are supporting the design engineers in design optimization now that's a major piece of it. This is the trade-offs that go on between the different engineering disciplines, mechanical, electrical, aero, all the different disciplines you might have be part of it. There's a trade-off between maintainability, availability, reliability, all those factors come into play with this and require you to work with the engineers to, to make sure it's successful. Then another one is, of course, supporting or even conducting the verification validation. Now, if you think about it, if you look at the, the skill set for verification validation, that a lot of that is the same thing as what you need for systems engineering. And so a lot of people get confused. They say, well, isn't systems engineering that stuff we do up front? Well, no, it's really done all through the life cycle. So if you think about that, first part is coming down the V. The, the, the middle bar, you know, at the bottom of the V is the optimization. And then the third part is the V and V coming back up. So again, that role for systems engineering is important to recognize through each of these stages. And the program manager needs to recognize that too, that, the, so, that they need systems engineering all through the life cycle. They're not, gonna, they're not gonna have a successful program if they cut out systems engineering at the wrong time. But you know, the entire time you need to, to also support the program manager with information on the design progress and support the budgetary and schedule limitations. Every project has them. You can only do so much with the time and money that you're allotted. And you have to help the program manager manage that. So again, that's on the systems engineer. It is not just the program manager who worries about cost and schedule, right? So think about, think about that as you're going through your, your daily life. <laughs> okay, so, so how can program management and systems engineering become more agile? This is a thing that's really out there. And of course, it's the agile software development that's really taken hold uh, and, and actually has a, is very powerful. Uh, just, you know, we've been using agile software development since the beginning of our development of our tool and still do today. And so it's become scaled agile, but it's, it's definitely agile still. So first of all, as you know, a fair amount of work's been done in this area. There's a lot of things out there. Uh, the, in fact, before I go to the next bullet, um, there's, there's uh, quite a big working group at the International Council on Systems Engineering that's looked into agile systems engineering. 
and that's been a lot. PMIs looked at agile program management. How do we do this better? How do we do it faster? Um, what we found is that we have a middle out process that works pretty well to shorten the time it's required to develop requirements for the system and to get up many of the other activities that you need to. So uh, that's one of, that's our process and I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. So this process depends on using a robust data-driven approach to capturing and analyzing the program and system data. Okay, so it's very key that we are capturing the right information and we are right data elements and that we are then tying them together so we can provide good information to the decision makers throughout the process, particularly program management. So, so this middle out process, you can view it in a timeline analysis. It actually takes the different classic steps of systems engineering and brings them together in a way where it's very iterative. Uh, at any point in time, you're doing quite a number of tasks. This can only be feasible if you have a database tool that can help you tie this information together that you're gathering. So as you build and capture uh, artifacts that are out there, you're gathering the information about uh, what is out there. Uh, sometimes I'm, I'm often working at a very high level. I've got policies and procedures. I've got standard operating procedures to work with, for example, uh, things like that that are, are kind of be the artifacts I'm going to capture. Um, I'm also then looking at any assumptions that are, that are, that are implied in there. Um, any, particularly any assumptions the customer has. Um, I'm looking for stuff that's out there. Now, step three down there, you see identify existing and planned systems. I want to make sure I can um, know what else is already being done out there or, or is about to be done. So I'm not reinventing wheels. That's a that's a that's a and that's a tough one because you have no control over the schedules of these other systems that are being developed. So you, tracking those, maintain them having alternative plans in case those don't work out uh, are important to, to recognize as part of that effort. Now, step four above it is capturing constraints. And there are lots of constraints, environment drivers, uh, that dri design drivers that are gonna be uh, causing you problems. Uh, this is again where your costs and schedule constraints come into play. Those are important factors as well. So if you look at the orange part, you see this, the, the really big focus though is on this, this uh, functional analysis, which is the main part of this middle part that we talk about. Uh, and, and that starts with a context diagram, which is operational, which means it's looking at the bigger picture. It's not just looking at the system itself and its interaction with things outside of it. It's also looking at the interactions outside to look for op opportunities to maybe really make a bigger improvement in the overall model and processes. So this, this happens early in the process, uh, in the architecture phase. Uh, so you're really trying to understand maybe, maybe there's some better ways to do things than what we've been doing. Um, then I wanna build operational scenarios. That helps force me to think about how is the system going to be used? Uh, and from that, I can derive that functional behavior I'm looking for. What am I look? What do I want the system to do? And so this is where your functional requirements come from, and this is where a lot of your functional modeling occurs. You hear a lot about modeling, model-based systems engineering. That's a key part of this. Part of it. This step seven and step eight, where we're deriving the assets from that. Um, that's all. That's all part of this as well. And then if you do the allocation of the actions, which are the functional elements, to the physical elements, the assets, okay? If you do that correctly, then the internal interfaces drop right out. So, so if you've done your context diagram, you've got your external interfaces. If you do your allocation correctly, uh, you will then also have your internal interfaces being defined pretty quickly and easily. And so again, this is, a, this is the point where the analysis can help you with the modeling to help make sure you keep those interfaces as simple and clean as possible. So that's, a, that's another part of what we're trying to do. Now, again, you're, you're probably wondering, oh, why does that, this have to do with program management? Remember, the program manager is depending on the systems engineer to come up with a very uh, elegant system design that will meet all the parameters for the project. So 
this this has a big deal and and the sys and the program managers will be very interested in that step 10 How, what do those look like what are the interfaces i we because you know that you've got to control those interfaces now as i'm doing the analysis you notice there's another orange line at uh, number 11. i'm looking at resources and resource constraints that's also part of the constraints factor that's why there's an overlap there I'm also looking at error detection and recovery. So a lot of people, when they're doing their functional modeling, only model the best case solution. You know, it's a it's a sunny day, everything's working perfect, every, full staff, you know, everything's great, as opposed to the rainy day where uh, <laughs> everything's going bad, right? And you got to have those the things. So so building building that set and your operational scenarios should help you build those set of cases help you go beyond that. Uh, step 12 is talking about dynamics, dynamic environments. So this is where we can we can actually simulate the models and help, help us derive the performance requirements for the system. So in fact, if you use Monte, uh, particularly uh, Monte Carlo simulation, it can give you a range of values that you can can deal with and, and, and work within the other constraints. So this is this will start building in uh, some of those other uh, KPPs and metrics that you need uh, in it as well. Uh, step 13, now it, there it says develop an operational demonstration master plan. Now this was written originally for ACTDs, uh, JCTDs, so we, we, we weren't allowed to do a test and evaluation master plan, <laughs> so we called it an operational demonstration master plan. But if you think about it, that's that's your that's your that's your plan to show that this actually works at the operational level, okay? And and so you saw people call the operational test and evaluation things like that. So so again, it depends what level. Remember, this is an iterative process. So you can use every level of decomposition. So uh, that that's that's fine. But but that that master plan is actually really important now, and particularly if you want speed. If you want to do, if you really want to do what you're trying to get done quickly, you want to make sure that's a very detailed plan. In fact, you should probably get down to the test cases. So you're not just driving requirements out of this, you're driving the test cases at the same time. So again, you want speed, you want agile, that's best practices. Software developers do that. They write the code, and then they write the automated tests to go with the, with the code, okay? That's considered best practice. So we should be doing that on the systems and program level as well. And of course, options. People want to see the options uh, with this as well. And of course, during all this process, I'm conducting conducting trade-off studies. Uh, remember, the systems engineer job is to define the trade-off studies. The design engineers execute the trade-off studies, and that's where you get that optimization going on between the different disciplines and, and again orchestrated by the systems engineer and then generating views because the program manager needs to know see progress at any point in time so having this kind of a systems engineering process really can support is a very first of all it's a very agile process but it can really support what the goals of the program management are too so this is why the, the two need to be looked at together now one of the things uh in this as well uh, and this is out of a presentation by Rick Dove. And by Rick, by Rick is is a real expert in the whole idea of agile systems engineering. If you want to read some seminal works on that area, uh, I recommend Rick's uh, work here. Here he's showing a uh, a um, uh, set of uh, systems engineering milestones at the top, which system then standard SRR, PDR, those kinds of things. At the bottom, he's showing the software epics. And again, you can line these up so that each epic can be a major milestone and then use that to help you develop what you need for the next milestone. So as you're doing it, you're also building a maybe more detailed set of requirements for each of those epics to do, to do more things. So again, that's one approach where you use incremental development anyway, and that, that also can bring you those set of requirements in separately. Uh, so again, conducting the systems engineering activities in parallel with software development is is key. Uh, we currently are running it uh, for our Innoslate product. Um, we actually have the systems engineers writing the requirements for the next version, as the uh, software developers are building the the previously defined version. And so 
we keep one step ahead that way and roughly the epic runs about uh, six months. So that gives you plenty of time to write, write up this next set of requirements, where we wanna go next. And so that's the way we can incrementally build the tool to make it better and better and better over time. Any systems that way, you can, you can take the same approach. Again, using the normal systems engineering and systems engineering technical review processes, setter events, uh, again, developed with that requirements for each epic. And then, of course, use your systems engineering pro processes to develop the CONOPS and conduct the monitoring verification of the integrated software products. So, so a lot of what you, you want to do is take, and again, you're going to create these test cases early on that you're then going to use to, to evaluate, is the software doing what we need to do at the operational level? And that's, that's a key part of what we're trying to do these days. Uh, and of course, supporting the op systems up by planning, conducting the operational testing and, and, and transition to operations. So again, that there's that role uh, of the systems engineering here. Uh, by the way, uh, if you really want to get to Agile, you really want to do something called we call model-based reviews. And what that means is to, to conduct the center events. It really cuts down the costs and schedule impacts significantly. It can take a, a five-day process and turn it into a, a five-hour process. And, and it's a big, big, it's a huge order magnitude difference in terms of um, capability for you. So, so highly recommend that. We have a guide on that. So uh, if you want to know more, be glad to talk about that offline. Okay, so, so again, how can program management become agile? Uh, again, the steps for model-based reviews. Uh, we, we capture the evaluation criteria. Uh, we can capture that as a document form in, in InnoSlate. Uh, we, we link it to the database content. So if there's uh, models and things like that have been developed or, or other documents built within the tool, you can then link them together and, and push people towards those. And then uh, you set up a workflow for reviews as well. Uh, that's kind of optional. It depends on how, how big a review you have, how many people, how strong you need that to be. Um, and then provide access to the reviewers, to the database, and, and then address the reviewer comments and suggested changes. And again, if you could do this all within the tool environment, uh, then, it's, then it's easy. It's easy to run the, it's easy to run the event. Uh, it's, easy to, um, it's easy to take the results and make sure they're up to date. And in fact, if you want to, you can even make that a, a, a rolling review. So over time, if you want to just have people come in and check things out and do it that more that way, that's a great way to do it. And uh, so the, once you have that basic rubric set up of here's what I'm trying to get done and then show the places where it's being done, it really is another, another real benefit of uh, using this uh, approach. Okay, so how does InnoSlate support the integration of systems engineering and program management? I've talked a little bit about that already. Uh, well, first of all, we do have a PM dashboard uh, with calendar and other widgets available. Uh, there is, it's based on the lifecycle modeling language, which provides an integrated ontology for systems engineering. I don't know what happened there. Uh, there are Kanban boards. So if, you want, if you're doing Agile and you want to track uh, your Kanban boards that way, uh, I will say that that Kanban board tends to be more used in the, in the software side of it. And so your software tools will also have Kanban boards often. And so you could just do your software tracking there. But if you want to build something similar in the systems level, you have a Kanban board. Uh, Gantt charts are a more classic way of doing this. It uh, shows dependencies and things like that. Uh, also, you can do process modeling um, and simulation, by the way. Um, it, discrete event and Monte Carlo simulation. And in fact, InnoSlate includes both cost and schedule factors in, in it. So you can actually do quite a bit of analysis of your actual schedule. In fact, we will often take a, uh, create a model of our process, use that as the basis of estimate uh, by loading in uh, the cost factors and, and schedule estimations that we can use uh, in, in, as distributions and then run Monte Carlo to get an idea of the real range and risk involved in any particular um, in particular development. 
And of course, then we can also capture the risks as in a risk matrix, and we have risk burn down charts as well. So a lot of different ways to capture that, this programmatic information and support, system, support the program manager using a systems engineering approach. Okay, so again, I've talked a lot for half hour, and so why don't we just go see the a little bit in the tool, so how to get you started with doing this. So uh, very often you'll, you you want to start here at the pro, at the dashboard of your uh, at your uh, organization. So this is Spec Innovations in the dashboard. Now uh, there's a guided tour. If you've not taken the guided tour, I highly recommend. I'm going to walk through a little bit of this to show you how how you can find the one on program management. So you can start there, and of course I need to sign back in, and we do support two-factor authentication. So let me do that. There we go. And um, so, uh, so, so what we want to do is we're going to pick this Lunar Rover one. That that has a lot of our program management stuff in it. If you want to see the other ones, uh, the first one talks more to the requirements, uh, the fire sets, uh, modeling, uh, simulation. Uh, if you want to build a, a, a software example. Uh, this Musify is for that. And then the Lunar Rover actually has all the things together, but heavily was focused on program management as well. So let's select that one. And then we come back up here to next. And then we have to pick two things of interest. Uh, in this case, we're going to pick up project management and workflow. Okay, so those are two are good. Uh, we could look at it, all the other ones too, but that, I don't want to take the time to do that. Hit next. Now this is actually building uh, from a database uh, a, a, an example uh, that we used for this. This was the uh, Lunar Rover uh, development we did for the NASA Break the Ice Challenge. So it's kind of an interesting project anyway. So, so when you see it, you might want to play with it more. If you want to see a more detailed version of it, we provide that as well. Now, the first thing is it points out the menu and you can pin or unpin different things and particularly you want to pin the project management up there uh, so you get that dashboard up there. So do pin that first. Hit next. Uh, chat with users, of course, if you want to. <laughs> and share the project so it shows you how to share as well. Uh, notifications. And then we have the quick links to recent projects and then creating new projects, branching, and managing projects. So again, this is a way to switch projects. You can also switch organizations and manage project. Uh, then over here, is, I, we, I mentioned workflow. So one of the, the workflow is actually in the schema editor. So this is the schema editor. And again, this is also where you might want to extend the schema a little bit. Uh, you may want to add more labels, for example. That's a schema extension. Uh, th this is a project level um, thing. If you want to, you can actually do it at the organizational level as well if you have admin access to the organization. So I, I do, that's why I think it pops up there for me. Um, and then schema is summary. Um, again, these are just some summary things that are there. So jumping to workflow, which was the thing we, we, suggest, we talked about. So you can set up workflow for any different category. So a couple of them out of the box that we have some, some starting points for you, issues and requirements. Uh, that's where a lot of workflow people are focused on. And so we have those set up. But you can add any class you want. You just come in and select the class, okay? And if there's a if there's a if there's a kind of a enumerated attribute you want to use for status, and usually it's a status attribute of some kind, you can set that up. So in fact, um, we we have a recommendation for the model based reviews where you would set up an artifact status, and you could use that to help you do your workflow for for the reviews. Um, okay, so so over the project management dashboard, it jumped to. So here's the main calendar for that. And then you see over here on the right is a set of upcoming dates. Now, by the way, notice in this example, those dates are in 2050. <laughs> and it, we did that because we got tired of up, trying to update this, this for everybody. So we put it off far enough away that hopefully we don't have to change it for anytime soon. <laughs> So that's one warning. That's why I want to show you one of the reasons I wanted to show you this example. Might have gotten lost by that. 
So again, you can track this, the due dates and start dates as well through this calendar event. Uh, there's also a di di hierarchy diagrams are below. Uh, they'll show you access to that. And there's also uh, task, task tracking. So this is, this is a, a summary of your Kanban board statuses as well. So again, some basic things here. You can also add other widgets here. Uh, again, this is a way to go straight to the Kanban boards that are available and then the Gantt charts as well. So here's go, here we're going to Gantt Kanban boards, Kanban boards. Uh, and you can create a new one, of course, if you want to, uh, or go click on one of these to get to one of the existing ones. And then you can also always use search. Uh, you know, we've designed this tool to scale to very large numbers, so you, you search is everywhere. <laughs> um, and again, here's your, how you set the new columns. You can create new columns this way, and new tasks as well. Uh, and of course, you can move these tasks around as you need to as well. Uh, of course, comments are available on every view just about. Uh, you can come in and at this where you can add your comments and feedback as you need to. Uh, of course, you can adjust the settings, the number of uh, levels, you can show attributes, sort of tasks. You only my assigned tasks. So if you just want to see what you're, you're assigned to you, you can. A grid about as well, there's a grid view. There's lots of different ways to look at the, the information that's here. Uh, notice these question marks are here. That's because the assignees were in there from the original project this was derived from, but now they're no longer on this project, so it shows it as an unknown user. Um, again, my assignments and grid view. Okay, and then of course, if you want to open up it in some other view, it, these are um, these are tasks, but they're they're class of subclass of action. So you can open up an action diagram of them even, or act or SysML activity diagram. So whatever you want in terms of your diagram sets, they're available. So lots of ways to chart it and see things. Tree diagrams are interesting at times. Here's your Gantt charts as well, so I can go straight from my Kanban board to a Kanban board to a, to a, a Gantt chart. Uh, let's see, next. Yeah, here's the Gantt chart, for example, and shows you that. Again, you can add tasks as you want to here as well. Now, creating dependencies is also available uh, between them. Uh, there's a whole process for that. Um, it notice by the way, it's clicked on a specific one, so now I'm seeing the sidebar of the attributes, and that includes duration, start, other things, status, assignee. So, again, this is a, ta this is a task. This is live, yeah, it sees the task. So you, you can see here that it's a subclass of action. I'm sure, we're wondering about that. Um, okay, next, uh, zoom in and out, of course, helpful resetting the view and then playing with settings again. Columns, levels, that kind of thing. And let's see, yeah, manage charts. So here's going back to charts view. So this is showing me my charts, my Gantt chart, my Kanban board are all types of charts. The calendar is a chart. So again, I can create new charts if I want to. Here's also where I could add a risk burn down chart or XY plot as well. The other two types or three types. Um, and of course, filtering and sorting, searching, and renaming. Okay. Now, again, so remember that this has, um, uh, let's see, okay, I'm not out yet. So let me continue this. So generate milestones in the chart here. So this is the calendar chart view. And again, here's how you navigate to different dates. Um, there you go. I'm going to do this for you in a second. So, okay. So, so if you get through the whole process, it's, it gives you an opportunity to request a demo, go to use the user's guide, or just click the X out of here. And you're now in the actual uh, database. If I go to database view, I will see the database. So, so, um, so let me go to project management. So, so here we go. Uh, and again, I said, notice I said there's 2050. So if I want to change that, I just click up here. I can just quickly go to, actually, I think I can click in here. Yeah. 
So you can actually pick the range this way too, by the way, which is a faster way to do it. And it's to January. And now we're starting to see these things pop up. So as I now progress it, I will see more events pop in here. Okay. So take a look at that. Um, let's, if I scroll down here, there are uh, charts, different, different charts that are already available that have been created, a couple of work breakdown structures, um, a components list as well for track. So that's another aspect of it. Uh, but board statuses, and again, you have mobile boards. It depends on how you want to look at them and then show you the status of each board. If I want to go to my Kanban, Kanban boards, just click them. Here's that Kanban board. And then if I pick on a task, scroll down here, you'll see all the different attributes of the task. And if you want to see how that's related, you can come in here and understand the relationships between dependencies. Um, one of my favorite is now the active. This will show you just the ones that you have already developed. So if you're not familiar with this active, with some we updated in a in a fairly recent version, uh, a few year versions back. Uh, let's see. And again, here's where you get to your labels if you're not familiar with that. So again, that's the object view, and every view has it. Of course, you can always open up the entity view itself of any task or any any object in the database and see a lot of that information when we're just looking on the sidebar. So usually, you don't have to go to this much at all anymore. Um, in general, uh, most of it you can do directly in the diagram. Hit the back button, and we're back to the Kanban board. So. Uh, similarly, let's go back to our program management dashboard. Uh, let's add a widget. Um, so there are a bunch of widgets available. Pick your one. One of my favorites is the countdown clock. Uh, you can do a lot of things with the countdown clock. So if you want to pick uh, uh, tomorrow uh, and pick a time, um, if it's uh, 1 p.m., add it to that. And then that, that way I know I've got that coming up. So you can again add that widget here, and there it is. So, um, by the way, that that has some really other neat things in it. I didn't realize you can put some images in it before and after the date. <laughs> you change the color of the text. Um, so again, lots of little fun things in each one of these widgets. So you can set this up that any way you want to to work with it. Um, so I'm, I've hit a lot of the basic things that we talked about. Uh, I'm going to jump to a different project. It's actually one that's live, and it's one I'm using. And I will show you how I'm using it directly. So I like the timeline diagram. This is my NASA STTR program, phase two we're in. Um, and I, I put that on my dashboard, a little widget that, that let me go directly to my timeline diagram, because this is the first thing I'm looking at. So in fact, I need to update it coming up here, but I've got my milestones at the top uh, showing here, and these are actual time ND classes, um, and shows duration and things like that. Again, you can see the relationships if you want to, um, active relationships that are available. Um, this actually has a lot of tailorability to it now. Uh, I, I color my, one, my items green as I go through the process and I meet the milestone or I meet the effort. Uh, some with the uh, completed tasks, I'll turn them green as well. It's just a, it's just a fill color. Um, this this is a research project, so there are research things that we say, hey, we're not going to go down that path. It's kind of a dead end for us, so we have we do that. But again, we, we capture in there the why we decided not to go there, uh, and, and so we, it helps remind us what 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 we've done and what we don't want to do <laughs> as well. So. Is in many research projects, a lot of what you're trying to do is just find what paths not to go down, as well as what paths to go down. Uh, also here, I've got a, a section for my deliverables, so I track all my deliverable reporting as well. Uh, and and this timeline diagram, uh, I, I I can I can summarize that this is level three. I can set the level to level one, and 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 that's usually what I put into a briefing because that that that's small enough to fit in a briefing. But when I actually brief the, the, the schedule to my customer on our quarterly reviews, 
I actually use this diagram a lot. So, so this is this is where I mostly work. And then uh, again, here so you have assignees, um, you have finish dates, uh, things like that. Again, a lot of this is this is research, so we're we're tending to have a little bit more open-ended kinds of things. In fact, very often uh, I look at today's date and I go, oh, I'll just move this over here because it's slipping to the right. And 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 again, for a research project, I don't care. Uh, you may care a lot if you're doing it for a, a, a one where the milestones are fixed for you. Uh, so, so again, there's there's ways to deal with that as well. Um, anyway, I just wanted to show you that uh, that gives us a little bit of time for questions. Um, and the, we have other diagram types and things like that if you wanted to talk to, like risk and things like that. But I just I don't have that in this project. So is there any questions? Yeah, thanks, Dr. Dan. We've received several questions already. If you haven't done so, oh, please send your questions through the panel on the right, and he will answer as many questions as he can before our time is up. So the first question is, can you auto-generate process models into Kanban boards? Yes, because um, so, so any timeline diagram can be converted into a, a um, well, in fact, let me get you one that I know works, <laughs> than showing you one I, I'm not sure about. Um, the uh, let's go to here. I guess I have it. This one. So, so we have diagrams. Um, and let me get my timeline diagram here. Uh, oh, I've got one class diagram showing. That's why it's doing that. And so this will show me some things like my acceptance test. Here we go. So this is showing me a timeline of my system acceptance tests. Uh, notice there's even a picture here. I can then show that as a as an action diagram, for example. And so. So again, there are lots of different ways to see the information just by selecting and 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 changing the diagram type with, with it wouldn't open. Great. Next question. Does the tasking feature send emails notifying notifying users of their tasks? If so, what info is in the email? Yes, so in this if you look in the actual scheme editor itself uh, on the workflow. Uh, you have notifications as one of the options. So uh, again, as as you get, you would get an email of the of the notif if once the next step is is made. So once once the status is updated to the next level, you would get the email. I I get them all the time, <laughs> actually, for a number of projects. Um, and so it, uh, it 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 does give you a quick clue to that. Uh, you also see that, by the way, in the activity feed and other things as well. Um, what was I going to tell you? Oh, so I, actually, I, I skipped over the kan Kanban board. So let me go back to that for a second, that question. Uh, so let me go back to my uh, little rover sample where I had good Kanban boards. Um, again, Kanban is not one I use a lot personally, though it's not one I have handy in a lot of my projects. But here's your Kanban board, and you just go back and forth to that and other diagrams. So if you want an action diagram or uh, or an activity diagram, you know, maybe you like SysML activity diagrams better, that's fine. Uh, we have those all available. So I think that answered the first question more completely. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, how does the PM dashboard fit with the overall use of the tool? And the follow-up question is: Would would you would you use the PM dashboard in a separate project and connect it to multiple projects? So the idea is to have a, a dashboard that that the program manager can focus their activities on. Um, so this can become their main dashboard if they decide that they'd rather have use the regular dashboard. And for some reason, uh, this this is blocking. So let me just refresh the browser here for a second. There we go. 
so so your main dashboard is here um, that's more the overall project dashboard so that way the program manager has their own special dashboard so they can they can put in the calendar and things like that that they want to do now they can set up the front one uh, to do many of these things so I don't know if it has all the same thing I don't think it has upcoming dates and I don't know if you put a calendar in there directly like that or not so I don't think that's available in the main dashboard just double check that yeah there's no calendar here you see so it has some special things plus it has that quick link to Kanban boards and the uh, and your Gantt chart so so again it's really meant for the program manager to have their own kind of view of the overall program project as an activities. Next question. That's all the questions we have. Do you have any last tidbits or notes you wanted one, to add? One in the, I see one more in here. It's, uh, can you show an example of a review workflow? Did you see that question? Oh, yes, I see it. Yeah. Okay. So, so the way that's set up, um, and let me go back to, let me see here the best, I don't know if I've got a good example of it. So let me just make one up for you. Um, so here I'm in this one and, oh, by the way, here's a picture example with the countdown clock. So here, uh, I want to go to the schema editor. I go to workflow. And so, uh, I would want to, uh, have a, uh, probably do this at the artifact level. Okay, so what I first have to do is go to artifact and add a status to it. So I'd come in here and I would add an attribute called status. And you can reuse those. That's usually an enumeration. We want we don't uh, we want an enumeration for it. And then you set up your choices. You uh, can say uh, craft um, in review. Maybe um, uh, approved, uh, rejected. Maybe that's. I mean, that's all I need is those four, and then I'm going to default to draft. Okay. So once I have that, that attribute's now added. Once I hit save, and I go to workflow, and I go to add workflow class, and here now I can go to artifact. A status. I'm going to add that, so on one that was available. And so here's where I would go through now and add the transitions, each one. So from initial status to draft, of course, the draft is the initial status, then from draft to in review. And then from in review, you could have two options. One is approved, uh, but also uh, you can add another one um, as well. Let's see, add another one, which is rejected. Uh, and then, so so that that would be helpful. So so rejected uh, could go back to draft, for example. So here, by the way, you may say, oh, I forgot, uh, I want to archive it. So you could add a transition to archive to add, if you add that extra status player. So you set that, you can set that up. Then you put your review team in here. So if I have a team of people, again, I can set up as my reviewers, maybe my software team's my reviewers. So they're the ones that, that are gonna get, uh, um, I'm sorry, the other way around. The team of reviewers would be here. And then the person being uh, notified would be me if I am the one who wants to be you know, watching it. So so again, I would, I'd, I'd use this kind of F part of the effort and then, um, work with that so again the the, the, the uh, you can see again you would want to lay out what that workflow is for you uh, it might be a little different uh, or maybe your organization even has a specific workflow they want to model and you just follow the same approach to that okay I think that answers okay, that question. for catching that question we would like to thank you again for joining us today as a reminder, we'll be following up with you very soon to send you a link to the recording and the presentation slide deck. We hope you can join us for our next webinar.
verify and validate the system life cycle on Thursday, November 16th at 2 p.m. Eastern. Be sure to register whether you can make it or not to receive the slides and recording. We also encourage you to visit our website and our blog, as well as connect with us on social media. That concludes today's presentation. Have a wonderful day, and we hope to see you at our next webinar.